Hello, everyone. How are you guys? Great. That's the way to do it. So we're really, really glad with Ben to be here. We're going to be talking about reactive all the things. So we're going to be talking with, about reactive programming, observables, streams, and lots of things like that. Are you ready to learn about reactive programming? <laughs> awesome. So just before starting, hands up who has heard about observables before? OK. Hands up who has used observables before? Good. There's actually a lot of people using it, which is really nice. So before starting with the talk, let me introduce ourselves. But before that, there's a warning. So we tried to cut down some content for the talk, but actually it ended up being longer. So <laughs> it's going to go over time. But the good thing is that we have lunch then, so we'll just lose some time for lunch. We didn't ask Dave and Aaron if we could do it, because maybe they would say no. So this way, they can't say no. <laughs> this is the best way to do it. <laughs> so the only thing that is here is that you'll have to wait to be like this. <laughs> and she tasty, right? <laughs> so now, let me introduce ourselves. My name is Martin Gontovnikas, but we're in the tech world, so nobody knows each other's name. I'm M. Gonto. You can follow me on Twitter if you want to increase my ego. I'd be greatly appreciated. I'm a software developer from Buenos Aires, Argentina. You can notice from my accent that you might not understand some of the words that I say. And I work at OutZero. OutZero is a SaaS that helps you with authentication and authorization. You basically first pick an SDK. We have an Angular SDK, which is awesome because I built it. And once you pick that, you just hook it to your Wrapper API, and like this, you get it working. So I used to be coding JavaScript all day long. So this was me. I was like a machine. And probably, because I was actually hammering the keyboard, I now have to rewrite the whole rectangular because the code isn't that good. But don't look at it. <laughs> just use the API, which is nice. But now, I work as a developer advocate. Not with Al Pacino, but well, we do what we can, right? Let me now introduce you to, oh wait, one more thing. If you guys want to try out OutZero, you can go to OutZero.com and just sign up for a free account. Now, let me introduce you to my friend, Ben. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Lash. I am the least animated of the two of us. Um, <laughs> this is my, twiddle, my, twiddle, my Twitter handle. Uh, please, if you have questions after this, which you're bound to because there's no way I can go over all of RxJS in this talk, um, get a hold of me there and ask questions. Tell me how I'm wrong. I like that even better because then I learn something. Um, but there I am. I am a uh, senior UI engineer at Netflix in the Edge Tools and Insights team. Um, I want to tell you about Netflix. Uh, they're not putting me up to this, actually. Uh, Netflix is a great place. It, is, it has been a life-changing place for me to work. They have a great culture, and I know that every time you, someone says, oh, yeah, my, my company has a great culture, I just, OK, yeah. Um, but they really do. They really do. So I would uh, recommend going and checking out jobs.netflix.com. Uh, they approached me because of my Angular expertise. So Angular is, is what landed me the job at Netflix. Um, all right, let's talk about reactive front end. Uh, functional reactive programming. So this is not a talk about functional reactive programming. If you say functional reactive programming too many times, which I just did, a Haskeller will jump out and attack you. <laughs> so this is, this is a talk about uh, functional programming and reactive programming, but just combining those two does not necessarily make functional reactive programming. So, uh, so the first question some might ask is, why go functional? A lot of us are very comfortable with imperative code. So, Here's a little imperative code example where I have this function that takes an array of numbers and it finds all the odd numbers and it adds exclamation points to them. Um, it's just looping over the numbers. It's got this result that it's mutating in each for each loop and it's returning it. Uh, this is a pretty safe thing to do in JavaScript these days. JavaScript is a single threaded world and, and uh, I know exactly how this is going to behave. But JavaScript as you know it is going to change. Um, I don't know anything special, but one thing I do know is cores aren't getting much faster. So there was a time where if your JavaScript app was slow, you could wait a year, and it was twice as fast. Um, <laughs> the, those, 
those days are, those days are over. So what's, what's, what's going to happen? Real concurrency is coming to JavaScript. Now, I don't know when. It, it is going to happen, rest assured. Maybe in my lifetime, maybe not. But um, yeah, the last time anyone said this, it was, it was Jafar Hussein, and the whole room looked like these guys when he said it. But not yet. So you're, you're safe for now. But a good thing to do to prepare for this is to learn functional programming. So functional programming has goals that align with, with uh, parallelism. Pun. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Someone got it. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the goals are things like immutable state and uh, no side effects, or more importantly, controlling your side effects. Um, and that makes it easier to spread the work across multiple threads. So you can prepare, you can get started with some functional programming. Now you can use things like array, map, filter, and reduce. Uh, I think we're all probably familiar with those, but this is an example. It's the exact same example I showed you earlier. Uh, but the, uh, the difference being that um, now instead of having this result array that I'm mutating in my for each, I'm actually doing it with some immutable state where it's creating its own array each time, and it's filtering out the odds, and then it's mapping them to uh, this with the exclamation points. So that, that, uh, that gets you started. But working on my app at Netflix, I ran into a problem with this approach. So the, the app I work on at Netflix is called Argus. And Argus is a real-time dashboard for the Netflix cloud. So it's got dozens of graphs on an individual view. We're using a WebSocket and multiplexing data over it. And it's, um, if you can imagine, you know, like more than a third of North America's bandwidth and all of these events triggered by all of the users that we have and all of the services we have uh, being streamed into graphs, it's, it's kind of busy. So here's what it looks like. Uh, you'll see that it, there's numbers blurred out. It's because I can't tell you, you know, how many requests or whatever we've got. So this is, uh, is, is this actually playing? It's not playing. <laughs> well, nonetheless. <laughs> This was an MP, an MP4 that actually was showing as, as you, the mouse moves around, it will actually uh, has some rich user interactions. It'll show hovers. It'll change numbers down here based on the data that you're over top of. And there we go. Look at that. See, Netflix can do video. I'm just a technician. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah. So. And when I change the time, it actually change, changes the actual underlying data stream and so on. So this is the goal. This is where we wanted to be. So we came up with this uh, proof of concept. Well, full disclosure, it's, it's an Ember app. So they hired me for my <laughs> Angular expertise. It's, it's an Ember app. People know this about me. It would have shown up on Twitter had I not mentioned it. Uh, so the first big demo, the first big demo, we were feeling really good. So I, I got all of my crazy amount of arrays coming in mapped out to what I could put into the SVG to create the graphs. And I had all my real-time interactions and, and these, these great things all ready, and we're ready to go. And we were, we were going against a set of test data that was, it was a lot of data, and so we were pretty confident that it was going to be the same as production. So on demo day, we did the test data, and then on demo day, we decided to switch over to um, our production data. And it was like this, <laughs> and then it was like that. <laughs> So yeah, and then like my team members flew away. <laughs> yeah. So the, what was the problem? The problem was too much array map filter reduce. And what happens is, at every step of your filter or your map, it's actually creating a new array in memory. It's iterating over an entire array, and then it's going to do it again for the filter and again for another map. And this is all over the place. We have arrays everywhere. So what was happening is the garbage collector had to clean up all of the arrays that we were creating in memory. I have all these extra cycles where I'm stepping through all of, uh, all of the arrays that it's creating. So what do I need? I need, uh, I need stream processing. So the, the idea behind stream processing is to take an array or a collection of things, and you process them one at a time through every transformation you would normally be doing with your filter and map. Well, RxJS observables enable this. So this is my gateway. This is my gateway drug into, into observables, is, as I decided I need this, this feature. And the nice thing is, when you use this feature, array filter map actually just becomes observable filter map. So the, the semantics are very much the same. But then all of a sudden, all of those additional arrays and garbage collection I, I was doing are gone. And, and performance was where we wanted it. So I started asking myself, what else can observables do? This is, this is a pretty cool library. 
Observables are a representation of any collection of values over any amount of time. So think about that for a second. It, it could be like my array is a collection of values over an instant, relatively instant amount of time, right? Uh, but it could be mouse interactions or what have you. Uh, observables can be merged, concatenated, and zipped together like any other collection. So if you're familiar with uh, things like Lodash or Underscore, where you have arrays and you're, you're zipping them and you're doing kind of elegant and fancy things with functional programming and arrays, uh, observables have the same sort of features. So observables are also a pattern to start a data stream, emit zero to infinite values, and then tear down that data stream. So they're actually lazy. They, they, don't, they don't start the data stream and tell you for each over them or su subscribe to them. And then when you dispose of that subscription, it'll tear it down. So things like tearing down event listeners or tearing down a WebSocket connection or setting it up. So what are data streams? I already mentioned some of this. It could be an array of data. It could be mouse and keyboard events, uh, DOM events, network I.O., animation, speech recognition, joystick input, really anything, anything at all that, that you could start listening to, get nothing or something from, and then stop listening to could be represented as an observable. So meanwhile, back at Netflix, R RxJS is about to solve another problem for me. And that problem is that sockets die. So I have this multiplexed uh, socket that I'm using for our app. And the problem was people would close the lid on their laptop. They would walk between buildings and lose you know, Wi-Fi connection or whatever, or this, the server would disconnect. And if they have the app up, it just stops working. So multiplex socket reconnection is, is actually difficult. I, I need to reconnect this stuff. But I, in order to reconnect, I actually need to know what am I already subscribed to? I have to keep some state on that now and then send that, those subscriptions back over the socket after I reconnect the socket. So it, it's, it's painful. It's very painful. So I can solve this with observables. So actually two observables. The first one I, the first one I worked on was a socket observable. So a socket observable is very simple. Uh, when you subscribe to it, it cr creates the socket connection. Then it emits all messages that arrive on that, on that socket. When it re receives an error or a close event that it's a close in error, it'll emit an error. And uh, it'll also disconnect the socket on disposal. From there, I wrap that in another observable that it's, it's set up. So remember I said that it's, there's a setup, there's end events, and there's a teardown. This one set up says, OK, well, I'm wrapping the socket, so I need to subscribe to the socket. And I need to send over the socket a uh, subscription message. Then I'm going to filter out all the messages that, messages that come from this socket to be uh, just the messages that I care about. And then when you tear it down, I'm going to send the unsubscription message, uh, unsubscribe message back. Another added bonus to this was my socket is what we call published ref counted or ref counted. So when all of my multiplex data observables are disposed of, my socket actually closes automatically. So um, the code looks a little bit like this. This is pseudocode. But the, the nice thing about observables is since they embody the setup of whatever is getting your data stream, they can be retried. There's a simple operator you see here at the bottom that's just retry. There's also a retry when. Uh, so you can get a little bit more elegant with how you retry if you want to do exponential step back or something like that. But it, it will be like, oh, I erred, so I need to go and do the whole thing over again. So that, that means that now I'm automatically setting up my WebSockets connection, uh, connecting or sending all the subscriptions to the, the socket server and getting my data streams as soon as the network comes back up. So fair warning about uh, RxJS. And this is, this is one thing I have true. Never trust a developer with nothing bad to say about uh, a framework or something that they love, because they're, they're probably blowing smoke at you. But the RxJS does have, have a decent learning curve. Uh, you have to change a little bit about how you think about things. And I think that anyone that's uh, familiar with Angular is used to used to having to do that, right? There's the Angular way. I remember people talking about that a few years ago. Um, so there's, uh, there's a lot of operators to learn. I don't even remember them. I have to look them up uh, a lot of the times. And uh, there, there is uh, a behavior about it that's sometimes synchronous and sometimes asynchronous. So there, there's, there, there are some things that uh, will be gotchas if you're not familiar with, with uh, the patterns. So another note, a quick note. Uh, this is the slide that I added that we talked about that's going to make it go over and make you all hungry, uh, about reactive programming. So just as an example, because sometimes people ask, well, what is reactive programming? So here, this is imperative programming. So let's say 
that I know A or B changed, and I have this value C that I need to do something with, and C comes from both A and B. So somewhere I've got some event, and there's code in it like this that gets A and B, adds them together, puts them in C, and then I do something with C. Right? So doing something with C is now coupled to A and B. Right? I, 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 can't, I can't do anything with C without knowing what A and B are. Reactive programming, the idea it would be to create an, a stream, a potentially infinite stream of A's and B's. So my A stream and B stream up here, and, and I, I could actually combine them into a C stream. So now I've got this stream of values that, that are my C values that I can use and subscribe to with this for each or a subscribe and do something with C. And uh, it's, it's completely decoupled from A and B. I, I could swap out my C stream with any other C stream if somebody else has a stream of C's they want to use. So uh, another thing that you, that another reason you should care about observables, so a, a birdie told me that in Angular 2, observables will be first class. So I am not entirely sure exactly the level of support, but I know that it's something that they're looking into heavily. Uh, but that brings us to Ganto's talk, which is how can we use this today in Angular 1? Hey again, miss me? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so, right? So how can we use it today? As Ben was saying, we can actually use it today by using RxJS. And of course, we're in ng-conf, so we'll be using the Angular toolkit, right? So let's start simple. Let's start with a counter. It's like a hello world for observables. Let's see how it works. We have a button, we have a counter, and each time I click on this counter, on this button, sorry, the counter keeps on increasing. However, each time that I click it, it increases a different amount because I get the values from the server. So let's see how we can implement this. First, the HTML. We have a basic input type button. It has an ng click, regular, as we regularly do. It has an increase counter function. And then we just show the counter object from the scope. So how do we do it regularly right now with AngularJS? We add this increase counter function to the scope. Then we ask the API server to get the counter amount. We get back a promise. From the value that we get from the promise, we first log it. Once we log it and we have the value, we just set it into the scope and we display it. So how do we do this with Rx? First, we need to include the Rx module. Once we have that, our scope will now have new functions. One of those functions is this $createObservable function. What this will do is it will actually create an, a stream, which is an infinite list for me. So, and to that infinite list, as Ben was saying before, we'll keep on applying some transformations. So when I sit down on the computer, I started using my counter app. Well, I was actually standing, but shh. When I was standing in the computer and using the counter app, at first, that infinite list was empty. I clicked the button once, click. I got the first event. I clicked it again, click. I had the second event. So this list will keep on getting values throughout time. Then for each time that somebody clicks, what we want to do first is to get the value that we need to count from the server. So that's exactly what this first transformation is doing. So we're going from click, 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 to three, four, five. Once we have that, now we actually want it to log something from the server. Logging something is a function that returns nothing. As it returns nothing, it must have a side effect. And the good thing about observables is that with this do function, we can just run something that has side effect without affecting the rest. So again, we have click, 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 three, four, five. And now we log and we keep on. Next thing, we're doing a scan. Basically, what we're doing here is every time that we get a new value, we're summing that value to the, pre to the previous ones we, bought, we had. So click, click, click three, four, five, and now it's three, seven. Why seven? Because I now got a four. I used to have a three. Four plus three, it's like seven, right? Seven. <laughs> the next one was five, so it's gonna end up being four, seven, 12. I actually practiced doing the math before because I knew that I was gonna get it wrong if I was doing it here. <laughs> but don't tell anyone about it. Once I get to that point, 
Now, I actually care about those values because I care about the different sums that have been going on. And as I care about that, I want to subscribe to that to know what's going on. And that's what turns this stream into an observable because I'm observing, I'm checking out what is going on at this moment. So this subscribe function is actually the name for this observe this that the RxJS library has. The TC39 is working on a spec for observables and this is probably going to be called for each, but it's the same function. Another nice thing about this is that this subscribe function can receive a second function as a parameter, which is an error handler. And that error handler can handle errors for anything that happens throughout the transformation chain. That means that if the flat map failed, if the, if the do failed, if the scan failed, we can handle all those errors here. And then another last thing that I actually didn't know and I learned it from Ben, so thank you for pairing me up with Ben, is that if you create an observable in JavaScript and then you don't dispose it, that observable will keep on leaving. So that will trigger a memory leak. So that means that I need to add this event handler so that when the scope is destroyed, so when the page is changed, I dispose this observable. <laughs> this was my expression. I was like, whoa, but I didn't really understand what was going on. So for me, I don't know if it's because I'm like three years old inside, but with drawings, I understand everything. So let's see it with drawings, right? We first got a click. Then we have a big box that is transforming that click into an amount. So click to three. Then that three got converted into a sum. In this case, it's zero plus three is three. This was an easy one to do. And now we get another value. So the next one was a four. And that will keep on happening throughout time. That means that if we are God and we look without knowing time and we look at the infinite, we will have four clicks, for example, that happened, which got converted to four amounts, which then got converted to four sums. <laughs> now I was happy because I was understanding it. It was like, yay. But once I understood it, I was like, clicking a counter is like very few events. Why am I using an observable? And that's what I get, yeah. <laughs> Not really that cool, right? <laughs> so then I decided, let's actually try with more events. And I remember from Scott's yesterday talk that he says, nobody uses ng bounce move. I use it to create the wow effect because ng coffin's awesome and it moves. <laughs> Go ng mouse move. <laughs> so what's the nice thing about it? If I move it fast, the letters are gonna pursue me. And something important from when we see the code is that if I move the pointer, the letters take some time to go from one place to the other. So again, let's see how we code it. We have HTML is just a directive. It's called moving text. And it just receives the text to be displayed, which is ng-conf is awesome, because it's awesome. Now, the directive part is not important. They're actually changing it, so I don't want to explain much, but it's, I'm saying it's an element, I'm gonna replace it, uh, the content of this moving text with the template, but let's see the template, which is nice. We have a div with this ng mouse move. That means that whenever I move the mouse inside this div, I will get notified, I will get called to the mouse move method or function actually. And then I have one div called text container, which is a container for ng conf is awesome. And each of the letters from that phrase we'll get here one span, which is absolutely positioned. So N will have a position, she will be have a position, C, and so on. Let's see a code now. So the first thing we're doing is, again, we're calling the dollar create observable function to now create an infinite list of mouse move events. Then the first thing we're doing is calculating a delta. What is that delta? Thank God I have the controller. This is the text. This is the mouse pointer, my finger. So I move the mouse and the text is here, the mouse is here and I have to move it. So what I do is I calculate the delta from the text to the mouse pointer, the X and Y difference. And that's what this map is doing. So I'm, I'm transforming again from mouse move, mouse move, mouse move to delta, delta, delta. Then I actually want to move each letter separately as I was showing before. That means that now that delta needs to be transformed to one delta per letter. 
So that's why I'm using this flat map here, because I'm creating an array for each letter in this text, and that returns a new observable, which is from array, so I know all the values that it has right now. And with flat map, I'm integrating this to the original. What it means is that I have click, sorry, mouse move, mouse move, mouse move. I, that I converted it to delta, 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 and each of those delta now is converted to, I, ha, I should have counted how many letters NC Conf is awesome has, but to however, how many letters the NC Conf is awesome word has. And once I have that, now the only thing that is remaining is to actually do the animation and move it. So for that, again, I'm doing another flat map, and I'm using this observable.times function. An infinite list is a list that will keep on getting values throughout time. That means that I can use this observable times to say, this value that you have it right now, create a new observable, but send that value in 100 milliseconds or in 200 milliseconds, but not right now. So what does this all mean? I have the text, I have the mouse. I move the mouse. I calculated the delta, and now the n will move right away. The g will actually move in 100 milliseconds because this observable.times is doing the index for a letter times 100. The c will be in 200 milliseconds, and so on. And the nice thing about it is that I did all of that complex animation with lots and lots and lots of events really easily with observables. And it's really easy to understand how this actually works. Again, I need to dispose it. Again, I was, yay, now I'm using something that makes more sense. But the important part is that this is just the beginning, because people are starting to know about observables. I mean, promises are now understood mostly, and it's like, oh, shit, I got to learn another new thing, right? <laughs> but observables are nice, and there's going to be a spec from TT39 about observables. Angular 2.0 will have it, so it's something that is really cool to learn, and well, not that easy to use, but it's really powerful to use. So let's just react to everything. And before ending, I was going to give out Zero t-shirts, but I actually forgot them in Seattle. So I have a coupon that next time that you see me, you can ask for a t-shirt. <laughs> That's all I can do. Thanks, guys.